Um, hello. I'm here uh, talking about map matching uh, when the map is wrong. So, sorry, oh, the mic up a little. Okay, oh, cool. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about map matching when the map is wrong. Um, I'm here from Lyft. Um, and so this talk, I'm going to cover what map matching is, um, how map issues affect map matching, um, and then what we can do to make map matching robust to any map issues that occur, and how we can use robust map matching then uh, to also help identify issues that might exist in the map. So <clears throat> first of all, I should say, from Lyft, our mission is to improve people's lives uh, with the world's best transportation. And part of that, a huge part of that uh, for us is knowing where cars are, knowing where drivers are so we can make good dispatches, we can make efficient matches with passengers, um, we know where drivers have been, um, and the map plays a huge role in, in a lot of that, and map matching in particular is a big component of how we use the map at Lyft. So what do I mean by map matching? So map matching is a way of linking the, the observed routes that we see, so GPS observations, to, uh, to the map. And why do we want to do that? So we receive GPS observations from phones, so they're mounted in cars by drivers, uh, as a series of lat long points. Um, <clears throat> but we want to tie those uh, to, to the map itself. Now, there's two reasons primarily to do this. The first of which is to improve accuracy. So you know, we know that cars, for the most part, are driving along roads. If we know, um, if we make that assumption, then a lot of the time, we can make the location of the car that we infer more accurate than that from the GPS by using that assumption of the roads, because the roads are already mapped in advance. That's, that's knowledge that exists in the world. Um, and we can use that to match the locations of the car onto the roads. So for example, if you take these, these green GPS points here, you can match them onto this uh, blue map match trajectory that looks like this. And if the car really has driven along this road, that's a more accurate um, representation of where the car has been and where the car is at any particular point. And that's very useful for us because if we want to do things like calculate the distance of a ride, <clears throat> this, by putting it onto the road network itself, kind of smooths out the, the path that the car has taken and um, therefore like, reduces the noise and things like our distance estimates. Um, and the second reason that we might want to do map matching is to associate these GPS points to a particular road segment. So this is taking something more like this view here, where each of these green GPS observations can then be linked to a particular map segment. Um, and so why do we want to do that? Well, knowing what the properties are of map segments can be important to us. Things like uh, transit time for segments is important for um, like ETA estimation, travel time estimation. Um, and maybe other segment properties as well that we want to learn from, from data that we're collecting. For example, um, let's say you collect a whole bunch of altitude data, GPS altitude, along with the uh, lat longs. If you see that repeatedly on the same segment, maybe you can use that to infer the kind of altitude of that segment at that time. And perhaps that's useful. So <clears throat> how do we use map matching at Lyft? Um, location, so where's the car right now? We use it to make that more accurate, that estimation more accurate. And of course, that's necessary for knowing where the drivers are and efficiently dispatching them to passengers. Uh, routes as well. So we want to know where drivers have been. It's important for knowing how far they've driven, how far they've driven in a shift. Uh, so driver pay, all kinds of things like that are linked to that. But also for things like ETA and traffic, where uh, we want to know how long it's taken to drive a particular route or a particular segment of a route, because that tells us something about the transit time for that segment overall, and then perhaps if that's you know, much higher than the average tra travel time, then that may indicate there's some traffic or some construction that we don't know about. So it tells us something about the world, and if we can, and we want to link that to the map itself, so that then if we uh, choose to route a driver in a particular way, or, or we <clears throat> think a driver is going to drive in a particular route, we have a better estimate of, of how long that's going to take. And then another huge use case is pick up and drop off. So um, pickup in particular is probably the, most, the single most important um, location in the whole ride because you've got to get two people with different views of the world, different equipment in their hands 
to the same place at the same time. They have to actually meet each other, get in the car, and start the ride. And so if we can make that process smoother, more efficient, get people to find each other quicker, drivers and passengers, it means that the whole ride experience is better. It's better for passengers um, because they find their rides more quickly. It's better for drivers because they waste less time uh, sitting, waiting for passengers, looking for them. You reduce contact. It just the whole process becomes less, um, less difficult, less friction. Um, but map matching isn't always easy. So um, the picture at the top shows uh, the kind of GPS traces that you get from downtown areas at times. Uh, you can see that it's, I don't know if you can make it out, but so this is a very noisy trace of GPS through downtown San Francisco, which is caused by things like multipath from tall buildings, just low visibility of the sky. And um, <clears throat> not only do we sometimes just get this sort of low quality uh, they say like low location accuracy. Uh, other times there's just no data at all. So sometimes we don't even get bad data. There's no GPS uh, for, for whatever reason. For example, being in a tunnel, somewhere where you can't see the sky at all. Or drivers have no connectivity for a period of the ride. So we don't know where they've been in that section or at that moment. Um, or you know, there's just all kinds of other problems that can happen, like your phone battery runs out if the phone isn't plugged in, or you know, maybe the app crashes. Hopefully not, but it's possible. Um, and then other times it's difficult just because it's very complex road geometry. So this bottom image here is San Francisco Airport, and it's just a, a kind of a tangle of roads. Um, you have this uh, loop of uh, multi-layer roads around the terminal buildings themselves where the pickup and drop-offs happen, and then all of these pretty complicated intersections coming out onto the, the main highway. So that means that because all these roads are very close, when you try to do map matching, um, it's very easy to match to the wrong road, and because the connectivity is such that you, that can end up generating additional loops in the routes. And so, uh, or thinking that you may be on a, a section which isn't connected to the pickup point and misestimating the ETA. So all of this sort of creates a bad experience. So for map matching, of course, the map is very important. So uh, the crucial component in map matching, um, it's critically useful. Um, so you can see here a noisy, the red GPS trace is a noisy GPS trace that we've received. We clean it up, we can turn it into the green, which is a nice path that matches the streets that were actually traveled in this route. And so the map information is almost always helpful. It's almost always useful to uh, match the points to the, to the map and uh, use that to smooth out the, the sort of view of what the ride looks like greatly reduces localization error. So because the map is so useful, we trust it. And uh, we trust it a lot. We, in fact, we trust it so much that we always make this assumption, once we apply it, we're making the assumption that the cars are always driving on the roads as they appear exactly in OSM. And that's usually the right thing to do, because OSM is great. But sometimes we trust it too much, because in a very small fraction of cases, um, Trusting the map actually introduces errors into the map match trajectory that we get. So the sort of errors that we see, uh, cases like uh, at the top here, the, um, the driver has taken a shortcut through a parking lot. I don't know if you can make this out on the satellite image here, but there's a parking lot between these two buildings here where it's obviously drivable through. You can cut across these two uh, road segments, take a shortcut. But that's not captured in the map. So when we try to map match that, the map matcher is trying to explain this path that it's seen, and so it has to, it makes this loop around the bottom because that sort of is the most plausible looking path, even though it doesn't really fit with the data. So I should say that the green is the, the raw GPS trace, and the pink is the map matched route that's produced from it. So the bottom example here is uh, a case where you turn into a park. Um, the little alley or the little path that goes into the park is not mapped here. So again, the map matcher tries to match these. Um, little set of points that as you drive into the park to the road network, that looks pretty weird. It does, it does a bad job here. It creates these loops. So this is bad because it, kind of, it gives us not only uh, incorrect distance calculation for this ride, but also uh, it gives us spurious road information as well. Like we, we know that the driver actually wasn't on these segments, but we think that what's happened here is that they've been driving up and down these segments. And so if we're 
trying to calculate travel times to these segments, that's very misleading and produces bad data. Um, construction as well is a problem. So places that are newly built. So we, we see new roads, new neighborhoods, and altered map layouts. Uh, you probably can't make it out, but this, this gray area in the top uh, left image here is uh, a construction area. And or it's marked on here as a, a mall construction. But you can see in the satellite image on the right that that seems now to have been built out. There's a road there, and there's a trajectory here which actually travels through some of those roads. Um, so we'd like to capture those kinds of things because that's telling us about an area of the map which is kind of um, we didn't know about. Uh, finally, yes, connectivity um, can be a problem as well. So sometimes we see a junction like this. The satellite image looks like this is a pretty normal junction. Uh, you can turn uh, left here. But the, on, as it's represented on the map, I'm not sure if you can make this out, um, there's only a very small uh, like crossways road. It's, for some reason, it's hard to connect through there. So what's ended up happening with the map matching here is we've introduced a spurious segment where we've overshot the junction, the map matching hasn't worked, and then it's just had to make a connection back onto the, the road further down. And so this segment there is now like a not a valid segment. It's a segment which doesn't really exist in the map. So <clears throat> we want to get around this by creating a, a sort of a robust map matching, which is going to apply map matching most of the time, uh, but not apply map matching at the right times when we think that the, there is maybe a problem with, um, with the map data, or it doesn't fit somehow with the motion that we're seeing. So I'll just talk a little bit about how map matching works. Um, <clears throat> a lot of map matching models are based on hidden Markov models. And these estimate the vehicle location using a, uh, the previous location of the vehicle and the current observation. So let's say we have the trajectory that you can see on the right-hand side here. Um, and then we've made these map matches up to the end of the, the blue line and generate an, a new observation comes available. So now we want to generate some candidate points for where the next road map match point would be. So that's part of the algorithm, is to be able to generate these points. Here, just use a simple, um, what are the nearest points on each of these road segments? And then calculate how likely the observation would be given that the car was in each of those particular positions. So that's represented here by the thickness of the green line. And the final step then is to calculate the transition probability from the last point to each of these candidate points. So. This, this red function here, again, the probability is kind of represented by the, the thickness of the line. So we take a product then of the, um, the transition function and the observation uh, density, and that gives us a weighting for each of these candidate points. And so you could then choose the most likely one and say that that's the next map match point. So uh, in the, the full process, if you have data available, uh, offline, for example, at the end of a ride, if you're matching sort of bulk data, things like that, then you can also do a backward pass, which lets you incorporate future information in the map matching. Um, so it lets you incorporate uh, information about where the car will be in the future into the map matching at this point. But this is, is basically a similar kind of principle. So then <clears throat> how do we take an algorithm like this and make it robust to potential map problems? So we introduce, uh, well, we use, we use a multi-mode tracker here. So we track the vehicle using both uh, map information with, uh, uh, sorry, we track it with map information, so map matching, standard map matching, and also without map matching. So this is like a free space tracking kind of approach. And then switch between these two as needed. Um, so like here, uh, for example, with this trace, um, it passes over this missing road segment here. So there's no connection between these two sides of this, this network. But in reality, there's just a, a segment there which is, for some reason, not in the map or not connected. So you start off by generating a, a free space uh, track. And that's going to be some kind of smooth version of the, the GPS. And also 
the map matched points that go along with that. And then now, using um, the observation likelihoods for the GPS observations, along with some prior as to how likely you think you are to be on a road versus not on a road, uh, you can choose the one which looks the most plausible for the set of observations. So here, the map matched observations look pretty plausible, so you stick with those. So in this next section, then do the same kind of process, generate the off-road segment, uh, or the, the non-map match segment here. But here, when we go to do the map matching, because there's no connectivity between, um, like across this, this section, the map match points, because of the candidate generation, end up being here. These are the only points that it's plausible to apparently get to from where we were before. So now, this map match trajectory doesn't look very uh, likely to have generated the observations that we see. So in this case, which is the, the um, off-road, missing road segment. And then in the final section, repeat the process again, generate the off-road, or the, the free space tracking solution, and then the map matched one. And this time, because map matching is following a, a road which is really there, we can choose that one. And so then you end up with this trajectory which has mostly map match sections, but just in these few places where it needs it, it uses off-road free space tracking points to link them up. So that lets the map matcher kind of jump these gaps if they exist, or any connectivity problems, um, yeah, or, or track along kind of unmapped segments. So one of the challenges with this kind of algorithm with um, multi-mode tracking is it's relatively computationally expensive. So one well, of the difficulties, yeah, is to make it, to make it efficient. And um, so to do this here, we introduced this uh, assumption of uh, so-called semi-interaction, where we take the interacting mode model and say the interaction now is only allowed in one direction. So off-road points are allowed to spawn new on-road points, which lets you jump these, these gaps, say but not the other way around. So we don't have on-road points generating a whole bunch of uh, possible new trajectories um, for each map match point. And so that's an assumption. Um, reduces the accuracy overall somewhat, but we know that the off-road case is a fallback case here. So um, by making this assumption, it lets us just run a single off-road free space tracking filter, which will follow pretty much the GPS trace rather than having to uh, generate multiple uh, scenarios at each map match point and then prune them down. And so then, this gives us a pretty high efficiency solution. Um, it runs in maybe a little under two times the, the speed of the HMM map matching algorithm within OSRM. And that means we can run it at web scale. So there's details, full details of, of how this works in the paper that's uh, up there. So then, what do the results look like from this? Looking, going back to those cases that we looked at earlier. Now, the image on the right shows uh, the results of the robust map matching algorithm. So here you can see that in that car park case where they've used the car park as a shortcut, it's followed it through the car park, map matching on each side, but then jumping across that missing segment or that kind of missing drivable area. And the map matched path, which is blue um, on this far side, is now much more, uh, much closer to the, the true path than the, the standard one in the middle. Um, and also, we're now no longer linking this path to the uh, segments at the bottom, and so generating those uh, that sort of spurious information about those segments. Okay. So similarly, uh, the bottom case here where we turn into the parking lot, you can see now that instead of uh, looping round and round on these roads, trying to explain this little tail of, of points that are in this apparently undrivable area, the algorithm just chooses to jump off the road, generate some off-road points at that point. And so this is useful for us as well uh, at Lyft because now we're learning about a pickup point which might exist within this undrivable, uh, or at least this area where we, th we previously thought we couldn't drive to. Um, so yeah, uh, 
Similarly, the construction example, we've now followed this, this path through, uh, through the construction, but map match to the junction, you can see at the bottom right uh, of the top image, map to that intersection where we needed to, where we need to use map matching to sort of get around this, this complicated intersection, but follow the new, newly constructed roads in this area of construction. And so in this final example, where we're looking at a connectivity problem, I just put this up here to show uh, like what the, what the sort of pattern of the, the output looks like. So I'm not sure if you can make out these small red points at the bottom, um, on the bottom right image, are the off-road points that are generated here. So you can see that what's happened is the, the algorithm has uh, matched to the, the first road as it comes up from the bottom right. Uh, then used a couple of off-road points to kind of jump the segment where the connectivity is, is maybe troubling for it and then go back onto the road again. So, and that's kind of a pattern that we would see uh, in you know, these, these kinds of problems, where, uh, yeah, connectivity problems. So one thing that we're interested in is how then we can use this uh, to start identifying potential places where there are map issues in. <clears throat> so looking again at that, that connectivity example, the, uh, the bottom right image here, which is all of the off-road points we've generated over a period of time in, uh, around that junction, in the geohash around that junction. And you can see that there, the blue dots are the off-road points we've generated. They're lining up very strongly along that road segment. And so that's a pattern which is kind of indicative of the fact that maybe there's something going on with the transition to that segment. So we're at a very early stage of this, uh, of, of using this, but we're hoping that we can use this um, to, to sort of help us find places where there might be problems, or at least help us find um, potential places where it's, it's worth investigating further. So we, can, we have a map data curation team that Renee and Alex were talking about yesterday. And so we're hoping that this lets us identify issues more efficiently that we can send to them so they have less false positives. Um, and you can see for comparison, a similar kind of junction, slightly different sort of geometry at the top. Um, there, the off-road points aren't lying on the, the road segments. They're much more in things like little uh, un, unmapped areas in front of buildings. So these are probably things like um, the parking lots for buildings, for stores, or little alleyways, things like that. And you can start to see the shapes of those emerge from, from this kind of uh, work. So we're kind of hopeful that this, this is uh, going to open up some uh, ability to use the data that we're collecting. So not only to make our systems robust to, to any kind of issues that exist in the map, but also to use the data that we collect to uh, help contribute uh, fixes back to the map. So find places where there are problems and contribute those back. So thank you. Hey. Oh. Sorry? A huge amount of time, yeah, a lot of parking lots, yeah. But for us, that's a big, um, it's a big and interesting case because, you know, if pickups happen in parking lots, it's important for us to know, you know, this is actually a parking lot where you can drive into it, you can pick a person up at the front of a store. You know, we see a lot of things like cancellations which happen when maybe the app is showing that the driver is waiting on the street, but the person's waiting at the back of a big parking lot and you know, they can't find each other, particularly if there's any kind of occlusion involved from a building then it's very hard to get people to kind of meet up, or it can be. And so we're hoping that like, this, this kind of thing will help us um, sort of learn more about like, where are good pickup spots, where people are getting picked up. Um, but yeah, I, that's, that's a, a big use case. Yeah, so we, we do see cases like that. Uh, actually, this is not too bad for, for this. I mean, I, sort of as an element of parameter tuning to kind of get it to, to work like that. I mean, those kinds of errors are, if they're very severe, are sort of important for us. But uh, yeah, map offset is, is something which uh, we see. And, and also, I think there's a risk of it happening on things like a very wide freeway, where you have a center line which is in the middle of um, you know, five or six lanes and there's a, maybe a service road at the side or something like that. That's a dif it's a difficult case to deal with. So, um, yeah, that is, that, we, do, we see that, yes. But I think in, in a lot of these kind of urban areas, it's, it's mostly um, 
alleyways, parking lots, um, occasionally like missing roads and connectivity problems as well, which are in some ways like the, the sort of the most interesting things that we would like to find and, and fix, I guess, in the map. So. Yeah, so the question is how, how to solve the ETA case when there's uh, like off-road off points, I guess, generated here. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I, I think that for us, um, you know, we mostly want to use this map match data for estimating travel times on segments. And so like this, in some ways, lets us recover better data from rides where you maybe do have like a section which is, is unmapped or goes into like a, a, an area where we don't have uh, like full mapping information because then we still at least get the two sort of bits either side still valid, still on the roads. Um, whereas before, without that, you end up generating these spurious uh, kind of road segments, and that that can be a problem. That can sort of sort of lead to either misleading information or just like invalid segments, which is requires like extra data cleaning. Um, but yeah, in terms of routing to points where for example, if you're routing to the back of a big parking lot where you have this like open section beforehand, that that is is tricky. I guess uh, yeah, we haven't really uh, started to think about how because we, we've only just started to sort of use this system, so we haven't really started to think about how you route to um, those points. But I think actually the ETA models that we have should be able to to handle that just by sort of learning from cases that they they see of, of those kinds of segments. Yeah, it's it's really difficult. It's particularly difficult at the start of routes, so like or at the start or end of routes, or particularly the start of routes, where you have very little other context information. So, if you have a long trail of points, you know maybe they put you on a particular one of these multi-layer streets. You know that you can only get to it because you've driven up this particular path. But if you're at the start of a route and you see it just a lat long, um, it's very tricky. Like which segment you're on, you have to kind of defer making that decision until you've seen a few more points, maybe you actually get off that segment to a point where they diverge sufficiently that you could say, well, since I've got to here, I must have been on these. But yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really tricky case. Airports are particularly bad for it because it's very important that, you know, we have a lot of pickups and drop-offs at airports. It's important that people find their cars quickly. You know, there's a lot of, of crowding there. So um, yeah, it's tricky, and it's one of the things that, that we're, we're trying to, to work on. And I think that things like, um, you know, if we can learn other data from something like altitude data, maybe from the GPS, if we see that, we can associate it with these segments, maybe that can help us to sort of disambiguate these, these stacked roads, at least somewhat. It gives us, a, like, another clue, I guess, to sort of track it down. Yeah, sure. With, the, with this? Or oh, just in general? That's a huge question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that I, with, for this work in particular, I think, I think that parking lot case is, is kind of important. I think that that's, you know, because if you're showing uh, riders a location of a, the car which is on a road, but actually the driver's now driving through a parking lot where they're searching for the passenger, and the passenger's standing around the opposite side of the building or around the corner, phoning them, saying, look, I'm right outside Walmart, like, why can't you find me? Everyone's get kind of stressed. There's a timer running. It's it's not a good experience. And so if instead everyone could, or the passenger and the driver could see each other's location in that parking lot, then hopefully that whole process would be a little bit smoother. They'd actually be able to find each other. So that, that's one I'm, I'm pretty hopeful for. Um, yeah, particularly that, um, I guess. Okay, cool. Thank you.